Hello, everybody, and welcome to week two of Poll 205, Women in Politics. Today, we're going to be talking about the waves of feminism. Maybe you've heard somebody refer to second wave or third wave feminists before and wonder to yourself, what is that? What, what, what makes the waves of feminism different from each other? Well, that's what we're going to be talking about today. So get settled and let's jump right in. So it's generally understood that there are three major waves of feminism that you can see on this slide here. Some people argue that we're currently in a fourth wave, but the thing about studying culture and society and politics is that, you know, generally there's no hard and fast lines, rules, or boundaries. So we're going to be exploring what makes each of these waves different and unique from each other. And hopefully you have some fun along the way learning about the, uh, you know, history of feminism, its various accomplishments. And we're also going to spend a lot of time talking about the fractures in these movements. Uh, how were women divided? Um, and not even women, right? We're going to be talking about lots of different people uh, throughout history in each of these waves. So uh, we got a lot to get started with today. I actually want to begin this lecture with a stop and think moment um, and have you reflect a little bit about the things that come to mind when you think about first wave feminism. When you think about feminism from the 1800s, what are some of the first things that come to mind? Um, second prompt. Uh, what do you think the main issues were or the demands of women activists at this time? What were the main things that they were fighting for? And then third, I want you to think about, um, you know, based upon what you know about this time period, what are some of the major successes that come to mind when we're talking about first wave feminism? So before we jump in today, I really want you to just kind of reflect on, you know, what do you know about the origins of first wave feminism? Um, and what are some of the things that come to mind? Because in this lecture, I really want to break down the origins of this movement because, of course, uh, all of the things that happened in first wave feminism uh, inevitably have an impact on all of the future and subsequent waves. So go ahead and take a moment to pause the video. And I want you to think about the prompts that you see here before moving on. Okay, let's begin by talking about first wave feminism. First wave feminism essentially occurred simultaneously with the Industrial Revolution, and we're, we're talking about the late 19th century here, uh, in which women demanded equal economic, legal, social, and political opportunities. Now, when we talk about the women's movement of the late 1800s, oftentimes people just refer to this era as the women's suffrage movement or women seeking the right to vote. That's what we mean when we say suffrage. Um, but the movement was actually not just about the right to vote. And that's why I had you do the stop and think before we jumped into this content, because a lot of people think that that's all the movement was about. And I want you to think through this lecture, why is it that first wave feminism is only remembered for, um, you know, getting the right to vote through the 19th amendment. I mean, getting a constitutional amendment is not an easy thing to do. So, I mean, there, there's some reason there, but I do want you to spend some time reflecting on, you know, why aren't more of these issues um, discussed more regularly? So this movement wasn't just about the right to vote. It was about women's right to get a good education, the right to own property, the right to earn wages, uh, the right for married women to be recognized as legal entities, the right to hold leadership positions in the church, so, so, so much more, right? It wasn't just political, it was economic, it was social, it was cultural, all kinds of things. And I want to call your attention here to this banner reading, How Long Must Women Wait for Liberty? Which is really a battle cry among first wave suffragists. And I want to contextualize this for a moment. How long must women wait? I mean, think about it. The first American colony was established at Jamestown in 1607, and it was 241 years later that we have the first women's suffrage convention in Seneca Falls, New York in 1848. 241 years later later, right? And that's just through the lens of the American colonies, not to mention the millennia of world history that subjugated women, etc. So before we move on, I 
I think we really need to understand the origin of the women's movement in the American context, what it was like to be a woman in the colonial era, and why these women were so frustrated, right? And, and why they so desired liberation and really understanding what they were seeking liberation from, I think is important. So throughout most of, um, throughout most of Western history, women have traditionally been pretty infantilized by societal norms and were also le seen as legally inferior or even non-existent entities within the eyes of the law. And those are two points in particular that I really wanna break down in more detail because this is the heart of why these women organized um, and why first wave feminism exists. So it's about to get a little dark here, but just bear with me. Uh, first, I want to talk about the status of colonial women in America and how colonial laws were designed in a way to infantilize, embarrass, and train women into what society deemed as socially desirable helpmates. And really by society, uh, we mean men here, considering that during this time, government was exclusively ordered and run by men and women were completely excluded. And this is the definition of patriarchy. Okay, so I, I want us to understand the era of history uh, we're about to dive into. And so during this time, right, when, when women exerted even the slightest amount of autonomy or independence, or God forbid they disagreed with their husbands out in public, women could be and often were subject to any one of these unique, humiliating, and sometimes even fatal public punishments that you see on the screen here. Uh, here, let's take a look at the ducking stool, right? This was a wooden contraption fitted with wheels to allow the accused to be paraded through town before being transported to a nearby body of water in which the individual would be ducked into the water repeatedly, right? Oftentimes, many people drowned um, as a consequence of receiving this punishment. The scold's bridle, right? This is a, a metal mask or a head cage containing a tab that's inserted into the mouth, which inhibits speaking and communication. Uh, this was a punishment that was often used for women who um, gossiped too much or argued with their neighbors. Uh, the shrew's fiddle, uh, also known as the neck violin, is kind of similar to a pillory that you might see from like the Amer images from the American uh, west um the wild west um so in these contraptions right the the wrists and the neck are locked into place sometimes a bell would be affixed to this device to alert the townspeople of the individual's approach so they could be properly ridiculed mocked and harassed you know all that good stuff um, in this particular picture, what we're looking at is the depiction of a double fiddle in which two offenders could be joined together at the same time. So this was often used for uh, bickering women. Um, they would be placed in this contraption until they resolved their argument. Branding and labeling was also uh, very common. If you ever read the Scarlet Letter in high school, you know that this was a common punishment for adultery. And we can actually see here the text from the original Adultery Act passed by the Massachusetts legislature in 1694, which Hawthorne's book was based upon. Um, so you might be thinking to yourself, wow, Dr. LaPlante, that sounds pretty bad. You probably had to do some pretty awful stuff to warrant one of those punishments. And, you know, no, 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 not at all. Not really. Um, just for fun, I wanted to go through a few examples um, of disorderly conduct uh, that was really likened to criminal behavior among women during the colonial era that could land you one of these punishments. Okay, are you ready? So, punishable offenses include adultery, arguing with neighbors, arguing with your husband, attempting to seek a divorce, being too emotional in public, blasphemy, disobedience, disturbing the peace, excessive chatter, gossiping, lying, practicing or promoting birth control, prostitution, pro public drunkenness, quarreling, reading inappropriate books, sex before marriage, uh, showing excessive affection to family and public, socializing with men uh, other than your husband, speaking in an annoying voice, speaking out of turn in public or in church, wearing too revealing clothing, and witchcraft, which you, we have to go into this. Witchcraft requires its whole other list. So like, what are some things that you could do to be considered um, 
a witch? Well, being disliked and children dying from undiagnosed medical problems, being disliked and crop failures occur in your town, being disliked and illness hits your town, being liked by animals, being single, being too into the moon and your horoscope. That's kind of a joke, but it's actually true. Um, being unmarried and economically successful, having a seizure, offering healing services outside of conventional medicine, outliving your husband, possessing too many herbs, and just, you know, general unconventional behavior or just being weird. So as dark as that was, I hope that that does contextualize literally how much emphasis society and also the law placed on the, the proper behavior of women um, and how laws were designed um, to force women to fit this mold of what the appropriate woman ought to look like, right? So first wave feminism is in many ways uh, about reacting to and pushing back against these societal norms about the appropriate way to be a woman. So now that we've had an exhaustive conversation about the social status of women, let's now pivot to the legal status of women. And back in the mid 1700s, if you wanted to become a lawyer, you read Sir William Blackstone's commentaries on the laws of England. It was the premier interpretation on contemporary law. And uh, uh, let's just be honest, uh, our boy, Sir William Blackstone here, uh, his interpretation of the legal status of married women was archaic, to say the least. Let's look at an example. Um, in commentaries, Blackstone describes a legal doctrine known as coverture, which basically meant by marriage, the husband and the wife are one person in law. That is, the very being or legal existence of the woman is suspended during the marriage or at least is incorporated and consolidated into that of the husband. In other words, once a woman becomes married, uh, her identity and her legal status uh, is covered by that of her husband. She becomes uh, essentially her husband's property. And I mean, you know, that's wild to think about today marrying someone and essentially having your legal identity erased and this interpretation of the status of married women we have to think about that had significant ramifications right it essentially created a reality in which married women did not legally exist you know, they couldn't enter into legal contracts or acquire property uh, on their own without their husband's consent right you know if they were permitted by their husbands to work the husband was entitled to and received all of her wages uh, married women could not bring issues to court because they didn't have legal personhood and uh, again right like even bodily autonomy would be denied to women. Concepts of domestic violence or marital could not exist because married women did not legally exist. And so you might think to yourself, oh my God, then why, why get married? Just stay single forever, retain your legal autonomy. But back then, uh, you know, being an unmarried woman or a spinster, as they were called, right, was completely socially unacceptable. As we saw on the previous slide, right, like being single um, suggested that there was something wrong with you, that you uh, had probably entered into a pact with the devil and you were a witch, right? It was completely socially acceptable. Um, not to mention that many of these distinctions were practically meaningless to most American women, considering that slavery remained legal at this time. So when we fast forward to the late 1800s, right, women aren't just fighting for the right to vote, they're fighting for their very legal existence, uh, and they're fighting for a social identity of their own. In 1848, first wave feminism really officially begins with the Seneca Falls Convention in New York. Um, and based upon everything we've just discussed, these women had a lot of things they wanted to accomplish. So from about 1850 to the early 1900s, these women were on the front lines trying to abolish slavery, advance the legal status of women, ac acquire economic and social power, and finally by 1919, 
rejoicing in the ratification of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which, as we know, granted women the right to vote. Um, but if we take a look at this picture real quick, you might gather, right here we're looking at the uh, National American Women's Suffrage Association, or NASA. Um, the, the movement did have a pretty bad reputation for being exclusionary um, of women of lower economic status or social class. And again, looking at this picture, uh, it was pretty white, pretty overwhelmingly white. And frankly, there's a reason for that. Uh, in 1918, NASA tried to persuade Southern states to ratify the 19th Amendment by directly appealing to fears of what would happen if the black vote were to ever surpass the white vote. So again, c consider, you know, we're, we're very much in the Reconstruction era right now. We've gone through the Civil War. Uh, Reconstruction is happening in the South. We've got Jim Jim Crow laws where the, the right to participate in uh, government is being denied uh, to black Americans in the Deep South. Um, and here, here we are a couple decades later, right, in, in 1918. And what is NASA doing? What are the leaders of the women's movement doing to try to get southern states to ratify the 19th Amendment to grant women the right to vote? Well, they are explicitly appealing to sentiments of white supremacy. They say if the continuance of white supremacy in the South were to prevail, then southern states must grant the vote to white women women. So rather than joining African American women and men in the fight for universal suffrage, many white suffragists came to the conclusion that focusing on white women was the only way that the 19th Amendment would ever pass. And not only were there clear fractures forming in the women's movement between universal suffragists who wanted voting rights for everyone versus those who merely wanted to focus on getting the vote for white women, uh, you know, there were there were some groups, yes, even spearheaded by women themselves, who opposed the very idea of giving women the right to vote. And as we can see here, the National Association Opposed to Women's Suffrage, formed in 1911, they had lots of ideas about why women voting was a bad idea. Here's an actual pamphlet distributed by the organization that explains why women shouldn't be granted the right to vote. Because 90% of the women either do not want it or do not care, because it means competition of women with men instead of cooperation, because 80% of the women eligible to vote are married and can only double or annul their husband's votes, because it can be of no benefit commensurate with the additional expense involved. Okay, what? Uh, because in some states, more voting women than voting men will place the government under petticoat rule. This is just a fancy word for how awful it would be if only women run the government. That's what petticoat government means. Um, and because it is unwise to risk the good we already have for the evil which may occur. Okay, so not only do these arguments reek of classism and privilege, nonsensical rhetoric, and flat-out fear-mongering, really. By the way, these are all the classic elements of any good propaganda campaign. Uh, but these arguments also run completely counter to the basic tenets of a democracy, right? A government run by the people for the people. And when we deny specific groups or citizens... Uh, the opportunity to actively participate in our government, we're, th we're not really a democracy, right? We have to kind of call that into question a bit. So prob these arguments are problematic for a lot of different reasons. And I haven't even gotten to the content that the pamphlet mostly consists of, which again is aimed at narrow, privileged class of women housewives. Um, and you might think to yourself, well, shouldn't this campaign really focus on reasons, you know, why women shouldn't vote or why politics is messy and women don't need to bother with such affairs? And I would say that in all actuality, yes, this pamphlet is actually doing just that. It's just saying it in a really subversive way. If we kind of like look through what's written here, in a way, what this is saying is that women need to remember that they are the head of the domestic sphere. 
they are in charge of the children, the cooking, the cleaning, and making sure that their households are fully functional and organized. And really to desire anything more, that just makes you ungrateful. It makes you covetous. It makes you a bad woman, a bad wife, and a bad mother. And these sentiments would really come to define the anti-feminist movement. Let's go ahead and move on to second wave feminism. Second wave feminism begins to crest in the 1960s and continued well into the 1990s. And unlike the first wave of feminism that was primarily dominated by upper class cisgender white women, the second wave was far more concerned with issues of class and race. The second wave was also dominated by a more radical tone that addressed taboo issues of sexuality, reproductive rights, and in the 1950s, it was extraordinarily common for women to be fired from their jobs if they became pregnant. Um, they couldn't open lines of credit without their husband's permission, and there were little governmental protections against sexual harassment and domestic violence. Job segregation was also the norm. Sure, yes, women had greater access to jobs compared to the status of women during the first wave, uh, but they were low-skilled, low-paying jobs. And in fact, jobs that promised more money and upward mobility would often announce that women need not apply. I will show you an example right here. Uh, it was entirely common during this time for newspaper classified ads to have separate sections for male job seekers and women job seekers. As you can imagine, the male interest jobs were generally superior to female interest jobs in a multitude of ways. They paid better, they were more likely to be full time, and they often came with health and retirement benefits. Female interest jobs, on the other hand, often emphasize low skill levels, simple tasks, short hours, minimal pay, and they rarely mentioned any type of insurance, benefit, or pension. And really, if we want to understand the gender gap in pay that exists today, uh, a lot of the systemic inequality that we see today about why women so frequently earn less than men, it really originates back to this practice in the 50s, 60s, and 70s of se segregating job ads um, by gender, where high-wage, stable jobs are really only offered to men, and the low-wage, short-hour, temporary jobs, well, that's women's work, right? Again, as I mentioned a moment ago, addressing pregnancy discrimination was also a major focus of second wave feminism. Prior to 1978, it was perfectly legal for an employer to fire women who became pregnant. And mostly this is because being pregnant is expensive for employers and companies generally have to pay higher insurance premiums for pregnant people. Additionally, they have to make extra accommodations for pregnant workers and make sure that they have the staff and resources to cover the employee's absence after their delivery. So really, it's just it's just really inconvenient, right? It's just too inconvenient for companies uh, to employ pregnant women. It's easier to just fire them. Um, but we also have to remember that it wasn't until the 50s and the 60s that women really started entering the workforce in droves. And for a lot of employers, if they were going to have to put up with women in the office, they at least wanted something pretty to look at. So if you've ever seen Mad Men, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, so for all of these reasons, pregnant women, re re they were really just seen as more trouble than they were worth. And I bring this up here because unfortunately, pregnancy discrimination it continues to persist today in, in lots of really harmful ways. Um, in 2014, UPS driver Peggy Young was placed on unpaid leave after her doctor informed her not to lift more than 20 pounds during her pregnancy. Uh, she claimed that she was denied accommodations at her work that were granted in similar cases such as those involving injuries. So we still have employers engaging in this type of behavior. Um, but if we look to the Supreme Court for guidance, it, it's not great. There's not a lot of really excellent uh, 
legal precedent uh, about the status of pregnant women. So we can look here at the Supreme Court's interpretation uh, of rights in pregnancy. In many cases, the Supreme Court generally defaults to this idea that uh, pregnancy is a voluntary medical status that's akin to cosmetic surgery. As we can imagine, that's problematic for lots of different reasons. Um, a lot of people don't understand that over 50% of pregnancies in this country are unplanned. So the idea of saying that pregnancy is a voluntary medical status, not really accurate at all. Uh, and employers by the Supreme Court, right? This is another Supreme Court precedent. Employers are generally directed to treat pregnant workers similar to disabled workers. Although pregnancy is not defined as a disability in the Americans with Disabilities Act or the ADA. So, so there's really conflicting advice being given out by the Supreme Court, right? Which is not great when that is the institution that determines the legality and the constitutionality of the laws in this country. So when we're talking about where do we go from here and issues that we still have to hammer out to achieve true gender equality. Um, unfortunately, pregnancy discrimination continues to be one of those areas. And while we're on the topic of pregnancy and reproduction, I wanted to talk about uh, briefly, well, like I said, we have a whole week on this in week nine that we're going to talk about this in more detail. Um, but the history of reproductive rights in this country is really terrifying. And this was a, a big focus of second wave feminism. Um, women, particularly those with low socioeconomic status and women of color, were often coerced to be sterilized after receiving an abortion, um, which is a, a really dark part of history that I don't think we uh, acknowledge enough. Um, in fact, uh, Buck versus Bell, a Supreme Court decision in 1927, uh, stated that it's perfectly okay for uh, the state to sterilize individuals deemed unfit for, for procreation. That precedent has never been overturned. Technically, this is still legal. And unfortunately, it's the precise reason why coerced sterilization still continues in this country today. I don't know if you're following this or not, but there are frequently um, stories in the news of whistleblowers coming forward that coerced sterilization is happening across the country in our immigration detention facilities. Second wave feminism was also deeply divided between these two camps of feminists that we call liberal feminists and social justice feminists. Liberal feminists wanted to eliminate legal and social barriers that divided the sexes, like putting an end to those gendered help ads um, in efforts to achieve true gender equality. Social justice feminists, on the other hand, believed that women uh, as a sex were disadvantaged and required greater equality or differential treatment, right? So here we see that difference between equality and equity playing out here during the second wave era. Um, and this is when you get into some pretty serious debates, right? Where social justice feminists are saying things like, um, we need maternity leave for women, but they don't make any mention of paternity leave. And that's when the movement begins to take on this more exclusionary tone um, and men start to feel more alienated from the movement. This is also right, not a coincidence when men's rights activists start organizing as well. And before we move away from second wave feminism, we do have to talk about uh, Betty Friedan's Feminine Mystique, which was published in 1963. This is often argued as the seminal text of the 1960s that spurred the women's liberation movement and second wave feminism. And in this book, if, if you, I don't know, if you're looking for some summer reading or something, um, I, I and, and you're into this kind of stuff, like read The Feminine Mystique. It's, um, it, it's a really important book. It, it has tons of problems with it, but like with respect to American culture and history, um, it's a really fascinating read. And in this book, Betty Friedan discusses uh, this widespread unhappiness that's plaguing housewives in the 1950s. And she calls it the problem that has no name. Now, Betty Friedan conducts all these really fascinating interviews with women to get at this problem that has no name. 
When she's talking with housewives across the country, they describe it as a tired feeling or, you know, I get so angry with the children, it scares me. I feel like crying without any reason. Um, It was so pervasive of a problem among housewives. Um, Doctors, again, mental health was not really a premier medical um, service at the time. So puzzled doctors are calling it, uh, I don't know, must be housewife syndrome. The, The only thing that I can gather that all these women have in common is that they are all housewives. Let me give you an ex- excerpt from for Dan's book here to, to describe in more detail this problem with no name. I've tried everything women are supposed to do. Hobbies, gardening, pickling, canning, being very social with my neighbors, joining committees, running PTATs. I can do it all and I like it, but it doesn't leave you with anything to think about, any feeling of who you are. I never had any career ambitions. All I wanted was to get married and have four children. I love the kids and Bob and my home. There's no problem you can even put a name to, but I'm desperate. I begin to feel I have no personality. I'm a server of food and a putter on of pants and a bed maker. Somebody who can be called on when you want something. But who am I? And that's heavy, right? I mean, like, that's speaking to this identity crisis that so many women, um, housewives, really were experiencing during this time. But it's also worth noting, right? Like, we're right in the 1960s. A lot of these interviews were conducted in the late 50s, early 60s. Um, We are right in the middle of the civil rights movement. So one of the big critiques about Betty Friedan's book is that like, really, we're just kind of talking about white feminism here. And this isn't a very intersectional text, right? We're not really talking about, uh, you know, the hardships and challenges and how disadvantaged women of color are. Like, this is a very classist book, by the way. But I mean, again, nonetheless, it's worth kind of mentioning and bringing up in this lecture because it 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 is responsible right for um organizing uh, this class of women into politics and helping achieve all of the accomplishments of second wave feminism but i think what's what's most important to note here is that the, the book is picking up on this identity crisis that so many um, upper class privileged white married women were experiencing during this time and, and this book was a call to action about how to take ownership in your life um, and to be the change uh, that you desired in society and in politics Now, second wave feminism is often uh, referred to as the radical wave of feminism. And I do want to talk just super briefly about like where that comes from. Um, Why is the second wave known as the radical wave? A lot of it has to do with uh, the language and the activism of second wave feminism. I'll talk briefly again about Ferdinand's book. Um, She uses really radical language to... um, refer to domesticity and child rearing and marriage she likens that to a comfortable concentration camp where women were not free to use their minds um so that's pretty that's pretty radical right comparing uh the experience of a bored white housewife uh to that of the holocaust maybe not the best take but you know the second wave is really perceived for being radical um, due to the um, engagement of um, younger Americans, and you know again like we're in the 1960s, right? So there's all kinds of like you've got like the free love movement going on and the hippies and the sexual empowerment and and stuff like that. So um, you know there's a lot of political theater going on in second wave feminism as well. Uh, the the bra burning and the dressing up the sheep as Miss America, right? Uh, for for those reasons, um, uh, again, like this is just a super brief lecture. It's known as being a radical movement for a variety of reasons, but this is just kind of like a small taste of that. I think the last thing that I want to talk about is how second wave feminism is really known for its significant legal achievements that were made for women. Uh, the Supreme Court case Pittsburgh Press versus the Pittsburgh Commission on Human Relations struck down those sex segregated job ads that we kind of started 
talking about this wave with Congress passed Title IX, which uh, prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex and educational programs, um, and also the passage of the Equal Employment Opportunity Act, which barred employees from firing female employees on the basis of sex or pregnancy. So lots of legal accomplishments from the second wave. Next, let's talk about third wave feminism. While second wave feminism often equated makeup and shaving and high heels and revealing clothing as tools of patriarchal oppression, uh, which another reason why second wave feminism was considered so radical, um, third wave feminism, which occurred in the late 1990s, uh, turned many of these feminist ideas completely upside down. Uh, women of the third wave stepped onto the stage as strong, empowered women, issuing victimization and defining feminine beauty for themselves as subjects, not as objects. And unlike earlier waves of feminism, third wave feminism is less characterized by a specific political agenda and more of a cultural revolution. So that's one of the big things I want you taking away. Uh, third waivers are perhaps best known for appropriating derogatory terms like that of slut and bitch in order to subvert sexist culture and deprive it of its verbal weaponry. So most third waivers also refuse to identify as feminist, which is a characteristic that makes this wave unique. Um, or they reject the label entirely, arguing that the term itself entrenches the movement in gender exclusion. Um, this definition and subsequent resignation of feminism has also been highly popularized by the media and American celebrities. In an interview, Lady Gaga was asked whether she was a feminist. She responded, no, I love men. Again, suggesting that uh, to be a feminist and to love men um, are mutually exclusive phenomenon. Shailene Woodley distanced herself from the movement because she believes in, quote, sisterhood more than feminism. In an early interview with Taylor Swift, uh, she claimed that she is not a feminist because she, quote, doesn't think about things as guys versus girls. She since kind of like walked back on those comments a lot, um, but I think in popular culture and media, she's still kind of critiqued as um, promoting a brand of feminism that tends to be uh, less intersectional um, and more kind of like a brand or flavor of white feminism. Um, but I don't particularly follow pop culture too much, so I'm going to leave that to uh, I'm going to leave that to somebody else. So thinking back to the lecture from week one, we were talking about feminism and, and people's attitudes about feminism and feminist issues most americans support the idea of gender equality right which is fundamentally the core principle of feminism but over the years more radical feminist groups have pushed a narrative that explicitly calls for differential treatment in women only spaces again equity over equality this not only created an environment that alienated male allies, but has also created a strong disconnect between what it means to be an advocate for women's issues. For many, the word feminism is often associated with man-hating, superiority, polarizing, exclusionary. And it's this final term that brings us to the fourth wave of feminism, which many argue is the wave that we're currently in. So unlike the third wave, which seemed to mostly focus on cultural revolution, fourth wave feminism is all about breaking down boundaries and dismantling oppressive power structures. The fourth wave is unique as it primarily uses the internet to call out things like misogyny in politics and culture. The Me Too movement, uh, for example, the hashtag MeToo campaign is a prime example of technological mobilization in support of feminist issues like sexual harassment and violence against women. This method of calling out socially unacceptable behavior via the internet has recently been characterized as part of a broader cancel culture. I'm sure you've heard this word before. Um, on one hand, you have some who argue that it's long overdue that people speak the truth and call attention to oppressive public figures and demand social accountability by essentially publicly shaming individuals. Conversely, you also have a lot of people who believe that cancel culture has gone too far. 
um, and that it's detrimental to society and that it does more harm to individual lives rather than promoting a good for all. I've actually included a 20 minute documentary in this module about cancel culture that I really strongly encourage you watch. The documentary is optional. Personally, I'm a person who really enjoys this type of content. So pretty much like most weeks, there's going to be an optional like film uh, for you to watch. You don't have to, but I highly encourage that you, that you do watch them. Um, I think, it, I think this documentary in particular does a really great job of highlighting the pros and cons of cancel culture. Uh, and these are themes that we're going to kind of continue to address throughout the semester anyway. So if you have the time, I suggest you watch it. Lastly, gender identity and sexual positivity are strongly embraced in the fourth wave. And it's exceedingly inclusive of queer and trans identities. But however, this inclusiveness was not well received by everyone. One of the largest splinters that you see in the fourth wave right now is between gender critical feminists and transgender women. So gender critical feminists, sometimes they are labeled as TERFs or trans exclusionary radical feminists. That's really a derogatory term to refer to a gender critical feminist. They essentially believe that men are men and women are women. They don't see gender as an identity, but more of a caste or kind of like social hierarchy. Um, and they reject this idea that trans women face the same obstacles as cisgender women. I actually have an excerpt from Michelle Goldberg, an op-ed columnist for The New Yorker, that I want to share with you that I think summarizes the major cleavages in this debate really well. So here's what Goldberg writes about gender-critical feminists. In this view, anyone born a man retains male privilege in society, even if he chooses to live as a woman and accept a correspondingly subordinate social position, the fact that he has a choice means that he can never really understand what being a woman is really like. By extension, when trans women demand to be accept accepted as women, they are simply exercising another form of male entitlement. And here's the case Goldberg makes for the inclusion of trans women in feminism. All this enrages trans women and their allies who point to the discrimination that trans people endure. Although radical feminism is far from achieving all its goals, women have won far more formal equality than trans people have. In most states, it's legal to fire someone for being transgender, and transgender people cannot serve in the military. A recent survey by the National Center for the Transgender Equality and National Gay and Lesbian Task Force found overwhelming levels of anti-trans violence and persecution. 41% of respondents said that they had attempted suicide. And while I don't want to get too ahead of myself because we have a whole week on this topic coming up, mass public opinion in America is experiencing a shift regarding its viewpoint on gender. This is nothing new. Gender fluidity and gender being a spectrum are concepts that have existed throughout all of human history, but we are having a cultural moment here on this issue in the United States. And we're having really unprecedented, very public conversations about what gender is and what does gender identity mean? How should people express their gender? And as we can see from these excerpts here, right, these these conversations have resulted in really sharp fractures in feminism. And in the wake of these hyper nuanced conversations about gender, identity, and expression, there are some who have taken this as an opportunity to really double down on traditional gender roles. So with all these conversations taking place in American society today about what does it mean to be a woman? What does it mean to be a man? What's the difference between being a biological female or identifying as a woman or being feminine, right? Like all of these different things have different con connotations. We're going to break them down later in the semester. But again, in the wake of these conversations, our culture is really experiencing this crisis over gender roles. And there's been a lot of influencers on social media who have taken this as an opportunity to bring clarity to the debate by really embracing traditional gender roles for women. And I mentioned this in the week one lecture, uh, but this movement is kind of colloquially known as the trad wife movement, a portmanteau of traditional and wife. This content is everywhere on social media. Um, 
you know, this kind of debate or rift between contemporary feminists and trad wives, right? So just for context, right, contemporary feminists, they're generally advocating for gender equality. Um, This includes equal opportunities in careers, finances, and social standing. They believe that women should have the choice to pursue careers or stay at home, um, that societal pressure shouldn't limit these choices. They're also... Uh, tend to be highly inclusive of um, non-traditional gender identities. Trad wives, on the other hand, they embrace traditional gender roles. They believe that women are naturally suited for homemaking and childcare um, and view this as a fulfilling path. Uh, some may see careers as taking away from their family duties. Trad wives also, also often position their choice as empowering, um, but critics argue that it really enforces outdated gender limitations. And you might hear words like internalized misogyny and stuff like that. Um, again, we'll, we'll get to that later in the semester. But I, I would say that this really kind of encapsulates um, all the different rifts and divisions that you see currently exhibited in fourth wave feminism. All right, guys, well, we covered a lot today. We just took, you know, a couple hundred years worth of history and tried to jam that into a video lecture under an hour. Um, Here's a slide I have of just, you know, major points I want you to take away from uh, each of the waves that we talked about today. Um, I always try to end the lectures with a a, a conclusion summary slide like this that gives you a good idea of, um, you know, thinking about the exam, what are some topics to be aware of. Um, So do take a look at this slide that kind of summarizes all the things that major things that we talked about today. Um, Again, don't forget to uh, hit up the discussion board after you've watched the video lecture and done the readings. I sincerely hope you enjoyed this lecture. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to, uh, you can always email me or put them in the discussion. I I always look at what you guys are posting there. So, uh, all right, that's all I have for you today. Uh, Thanks for watching and I will see you again next week.